Continuing our reading in Abraham Hannibal and the Battle for the Throne by Francis Summers Cox, Chapter 7, A Voice from the Past. Life in the palace wasn't all hard work. Abraham made a friend, Orhan, in the palace offices, who sometimes let him look at the precious books from the palace libraries, beautifully handwritten and decorated, like the ones back home in Ethiopia, not machine printed like the French books the Dr. Ponset had shown him back in Ethiopia. And magical books they were too, with curly gold Arabic letters and pictures rich with deep bright colors and pure gold leaf. Orhan would sometimes give him paper and pens, and sometimes Abraham would have to go at copying a picture, or even drawing an archway or a window, and Orham would watch over his shoulder and be impressed. You shouldn't be a gardener, Ibrahim. You should be trained up as a scribe or a book illustrator, maybe even as an architect. But Mustafa would quickly bring him down to earth. Not a chance, Ibrahim. Not a chance. Nobody changes his jobs here. Uh, you stay where God puts you, and that's the end of it. There were even lighter times, too. Often Uncle Mustafa used to take him to one or another of the wonderful steam baths inside the palace walls, where to the first time, for the first time Abraham felt how wonderful it was to flop in the hot steam baths and the icy cold baths and the steam rooms where you nearly fainted from the heat, but all your aches and tiredness floated away. And his master had a surprisingly mischievous side to him, which one day led to a marvelous discovery. Every now and then, the black slave guards used to come out of the forbidden palace and stroll in the bigger courtyards. Most of them were far too fat and looked dreadfully unhealthy. They wore the mo most magnificent long robes and the strangest hats, enormously tall and narrow. One day, Abraham was planting out some seedlings in the flower beds in the second courtyard when Mustafa came by. You know why these black slave guards are so fat and ugly, don't you, boy? He said, grinning. Abraham looked blank. <clears throat> no, why? So that the sultan's slave girls won't fall in love with them, of course, laughed Mustafa. He suddenly crouched down and got very busy helping Abraham. Shh, here they come. Forget I spoke. Mustafa waited until two black slave guards swept past. You know, Abraham. I've just thought of something. One of those men is the chief black slave. I have an idea that he comes from your homeland. It is Ethiopia, isn't it? Abraham's face lit up. Really? I'd love to speak to him about it. Do you think I dare? Mustafa thought for a moment. Uh, get yourself washed, quickly. We'll see if we can catch him. They found the two men resting by a fountain. Mustafa bowed to the older, more grandly dressed of the two. He was a giant of a man, tall and broad, as well as fat, dark-skinned, though not as dark as Abraham. A peace be with you, O oh, most gracious Lord, said Mustafa. A peace be with you, gardener. I have a boy here who wishes to speak with you about a certain land. Indeed, then let him speak. O uh, oh, most gracious Lord, began Abraham in Turkish, since it seemed to be the right thing to say. And then he suddenly burst out in his own language, the language of Ethiopia, that he hadn't spoken for so long. Uh, greetings! I have heard that your, your, that your home is Ethiopia. And then to his dismay he dried, and more words wouldn't come. The old fat man jumped and stared at Abraham, then smiled and very, very slowly started answering in the same language, uh, greetings, boy. You are from Ethiopia? Then he shook his head and said in Turkish, uh, It's no use. It's been too many years. I have forgotten my own language. I think, my boy, that you have too. He waved his hand at Mustafa and his friend. Let us, if you please. I wish to speak with this boy. Sit at my feet, boy. Let us think of past days. What do you remember of your home? So Abraham told the old slave about his family, about his home, and about how he came to leave his country. And then the old man told him about his childhood. He remembered very little, 
and how he had been captured by Arab raiders and taken north down the river, the Nile River, and then across the sea to the Sultan's palace. Darkness began to fall. The old man sighed. I must go back home now, except that we have no real home, you and I. There are many, uh, many like us in this palace, little boy. He shook his head sadly, and his flabby cheeks wobbled. You are more fortunate than I, boy. I have great power and riches, but only a little happiness, a very little. No wife, no children, no comfort in my old age. And now it is too late. You have your whole life in front of you. Who knows what may happen? Abraham did, did feel sorry for the old man, but he was suddenly distracted by an idea. Uh, I know, I, I think I know, a girl in the Forbidden Palace. The old man raised his eyebrows in shock. I know her from before. She is from England. Her name is Elizabeth. The chief black slave guard gave a puzzled frown. She is about 16 years of age, and she has golden hair and blue eyes, went on Abraham. Ah, yes, I, I know the one. She is beautiful. We call her Morning Star. How is she? Is she well? asked Abraham anxiously. How can she not be well? She is the most beautiful of the slave girls. If I could write a message, um, could you give it to her, please? Do not mention it to anyone, and I will do it. Have it ready by this time tomorrow. But now, I must go back. That night, Abraham asked Orhan from the palace offices if he could borrow some paper and pen and ink. And by lamplight, he drew a picture of himself with a spade and some flowers and another one of Elizabeth dressed as she had been on the ship, with a chessboard next to her, except that he had to draw it standing up so that you could see the black and white squares and work out what it was supposed to be. And with great difficulty, not at all sure that he remembered how to do it correctly, he wrote Abraham and Elizabeth underneath the picture in English letters. Two days later, he got his reply. It was a picture of Elizabeth in the kind of clothes she had been made to wear at the slave market, with tears running down her cheeks and her name. That was all. Abraham did not try to get in touch with Elizabeth again. It's hopeless. What can I do to cheer her up? We can't even write each other proper letters. It's just too terrible to think about. But every time he saw the chief black slave strolling in the courtyard, he used to greet. they used to greet each other in their own language, and then Abraham would ask in Turkish, uh, Morning, uh, how is Morning Star, O most gracious Lord? And the old slave would smile and reply, She is well, my young friend. And Abraham would feel comforted. The months passed by. One of the worst jobs was when Abraham had to help with night parties. It meant going to bed very late and still having to get up at dawn the next day. But that wasn't the worst of it. The worst bit was fixing the lamps on the tortoises. His Highness the Sultan, the shadow of God on earth, had somehow got the idea that it would be fun to light up nighttime parties by having tortoises crawling through the flower beds and across the lawn with little oil lamps on their backs. The amount of work this involved was unbelievable. First, you, ha you spent the whole day in between the other jobs around the garden catching the tortoises and putting them in their pen. Then in the evening you had to take hold of them one by one and tie the fiddly little brass lamps on their backs with nasty stiff little gold ribbons that tied under their stomachs. If you put the oil in the lamp beforehand, most of it dribbled out when you were struggling to tie the lamp on. But if you didn't, it was a dreadful business trying to keep the tortoises still while you poured the oil into the little hole. Then you had to light the lamps with a nasty, smoking kind of skinny candle, which kept going out. At last, when it was properly dark, you could let the tortoises loose and wait for all the guests to notice and start clapping politely. Well, it did look quite sweet, all those little lights wandering very slowly through the tulips. But then the poor creatures would get so nervous about all these things going on, these strange things, that half the time they would refuse to move or go and hide under a bush and knock their lamps crooked. Crazy, completely crazy. There was only one tortoise, a big old one, who had any sense at all, and always behaved himself. It only took a minute to catch her, 
and put lamp, uh, put her lamp on her. But actually, Abraham often used to talk to her for a bit longer, since he had grown quite fond of her. He decided her name was Lucky. Then one day, Abraham got news, which made him feel quite different about the garden party that night. And that's the end of chapter 7.